but nice to see you working again here in Vienna. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you for coming. And um, can you tell us about your new projects? About my new projects, I have a very interesting um, German TV series called uh, Sokodona, where I played a country singer. And uh, I can't talk too much about it, but it was super funny because we're traveling to all these small Austrian villages and I was really on this like big marketplaces on a trailer singing in a microphone and they filmed everything. It's, it's, it was super fun. So this will be will premiere somewhere later this year, I think. Exactly when, I don't know, but it's going to be in Austria and Germany. And besides that, I have a, um, next week's going to be the, the premiere of an international series called The Others or The Outliers. I think they didn't select the English title yet. We shot that before the war in St. Petersburg and other places. And it's kind of an um, alternative fantasy. It's really, it's a bit like X-Men-like, but set between both world wars, uh, which was a very strange and dark time initially. And there they, um, so goes the story, there's um, people who develop superpowers, different kinds of. And there's one guy, he's a very strange, mysterious German duke. So he's an aristocrat, he owns a whole castle. And he collects these people, mainly when they're kids. So he's kind of like trying, starting kind of like an academy of very um, talented and, how to say, it, powerful children. And then he, the word gets out of a very powerful young woman from somewhere from the north and the Soviets are trying to like um, arrest her for some murder she did not commit whatever and my character learns that she exists and tries to save her basically and then sets off things in motion and it's it's very interesting because my character has very interesting superpowers hers and everything in between and it's like a whole uh it's with really uh, really good colleagues it's, it's a very good cast and it was very interesting to stand there and do this with your hands and this with your hands and then they say okay and now there will be special effects but this will do later there will be things coming out sparks or whatever waves of energy and so uh we shot that that was very interesting I'm looking forward to that actually and you also like fantasy literature. I am a huge fan. I'm a huge fan of Lord of the Rings and Game of Thrones and um, basically even like Harry Potter, even though it's a bit, a bit less. But I, uh, I was hooked mainly about Lord of the Rings, to be honest. So um, I was really, when I, when I read the books as a teenager, uh, that was one of the reasons why I went to acting, to be honest, because I wanted that to, see, to see that on screen. And then it's, it's when I graduated from high school, the movies were almost out already. So it was, uh, I was very happy to be part of that, kind of like at least time-wise. So I'm very happy that they like start investigating into that as well. And I also have some ideas about such big projects myself. So, yeah. And do you wish to produce something yourself? I do. I already produced something myself. Actually, I already produced um, three projects as a creative producer. One just aired. It's called Legends of Sambo, mm. which is about a um, martial arts movie about three legends, how a um, former Soviet martial arts called Sambo was initially uh, created. And I play one of the two leads. Plus, I'm the creative producer, and thank God it was a it was successful the movie. So I'm very happy that the audience, the reactions were very good, and people were had warm feelings when they left the cinema. They really uh, the reception was very good. So I was I was I was happy, and I like producing because it gives you it lets you dive deeper into the material, kind of or at least into the project. It gives you more control and more responsibility. Because as an actor, usually you come on set, you, I mean, you prepare, of course, you have an audition, but you, you enter usually a project very late. So the project already exists, the story is written, 15,000 different drafts until you have the story. And then in the end, you have, um, 
you have the castings, sometimes weeks before the major um, shooting starts. And then you come on set, you deliver your lines, you whatever be you are with the uh, with the other actors, with the director, maybe producer, whatever on set for a couple of weeks, if you're lucky, maybe two or three months max. And then you're out basically. And then you never know what's gonna happen with the project. And I had a couple of times that I um, played some potential or big parts in, in, in nice projects who ended up not being that successful or not that good actually. And I really wondered why for quite a while, because there's many um, good stories, amazing actors, but I did not see that many good movies lately. I saw many movies, but not everything was great, of course. But I barely saw any bad acting, to be honest. One of the reasons I went into producing, or why I'm interested in it, is because I, uh, in the last five years, for example, I saw, I saw almost only really good um, performances by actors and actresses. Almost nothing that didn't convince me. So it really felt like the, the level and the quality of acting worldwide has really gone up a lot. Maybe there's so much competition, whatever, but it really like the whole industry benefits from it. But I have not seen that many good projects and movies. And then I felt like, okay, come on, apparently it does not mainly depend on acting. Because there's really like shitty movies or movies that didn't reach me in a, in a, in a, in a big time where uh, the acting was great. So I felt like, okay, apparently it doesn't only depend on this. And combined with the experience I had with projects of mine where the cast was amazing, the director was amazing, the story was great. And in the end, the movie was so-so. And I felt like, okay, what happened? And this question led me to, okay, apparently the power of the producers after the, uh, the general shooting finished uh, is quite big. And that led me to the wish to be able to control more of a project to like help it nurture it from the beginning of an idea until the premiere and even further to send it to festivals to live the journey live the life of a movie because in the end it's like a child so you really have to like start and nurture it give it the milk bottle or whatever until in the end it gets it grows up and then it goes its own way and then you hopefully say okay i've done my work and you can wave goodbye and hopefully it win something or mainly uh, the big wish is of course that it gets seen by people so that was my my way my path into directing I mean into producing I'm still new to this but I do have my own projects which I'm developing right now step by step and um, I was lucky that in the past I would say decade I got to work with many really good, really great artists, filmmakers, be it in front or behind the camera. And that helped me a lot to develop a sort of style or experience too, which I now try to use for my own projects. So my main thing is not to <laughs> just not repeat the bad stuff, just repeat or copy the positive experiences. Was it difficult to prepare for the role of Ashepko? It was not that hard because I've worked with Andrei Bagatyrov, my friend for like... Right now we already finished three projects actually. Uh, but after uh, Red Ghost, which was our initial uh, project, which thank God became a huge success. And uh, which uh, really kind of was the start of our friendship and, and creative collaboration. And there, um, when he presented me with another script, like one or two years after after we shot uh, Red Ghost, I was I read it of course because it's Andre, but then I felt like Andre, it's very kind of you, but I don't know which role because there were only like four German roles in there, and before I mainly played Germans of course, and and, and outside of of Austria, Russia, uh, no, outside of Austria, Germany, and so uh, it was like German number one, two, three, and four, and then he said no no no. I wanted to play to look at Ashepkov. I was like, who? And I said, yeah, read it again, but with this character. So I read the script again, and it's one of the two lead roles. And I said, yeah, but Andre, but he's fully Russian. <laughs> I said, I don't care. He can do it. It's fine. We'll just like W or anything. And then he's bold. Yeah, whatever. We'll find a way. So, <laughs> and in the end, I mean, he knew that I uh, have been doing martial arts for more than like I don't know, ages, seventeen years or whatever. So it was kind of like, I did. I have never done sambo before, of course, but. 
uh, we had like three quite intensive weeks of um, rehearsals and training and so and I was working with somebody still with some some guys who were like professionals in that sports and they taught us everything they were like funny moments we had like a whole like three or four different choreographies mainly the the big main fight between Spiridonov and Ashepkov had to be uh, rehearsed and I was very lucky because Dima my colleague he is a professional instructor in Aikido if I'm not mistaken so he's also a martial artist basically he's really it was really nice so we ended up basically doing all the stunts ourselves which I usually prefer when I can shoot because it just gives me more control of the character and more control of the story and and usually the camera guys are happy too because they can also film my face when I get beaten not only the the ass or the body or the back because it's a stunt now or stand in whatever so and that was funny we had long shooting days and uh long nights were there any interesting behind the scenes stories uh no it was only funny that dima i mean he sometimes got so into character so into the the fights that he like applied real pressure to all these things he did and i was like Dima, Dima, stop stop it's uh, it's hurting the camera is not even rolling anymore you can stop oh sorry sorry, sorry. that that happened a couple of times but besides that uh i mean the i was not bold in real life i couldn't because i had four project parallels where i had to switch and jump and one with long hair one with short hair one with like no hair so they ended up gluing my hair every day so i was there in 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 in, in the makeup department like two hours before shooting every morning and that was a challenge but and that's why i end up having like such a huge head for whatever reason i look a bit like an alien in my opinion. <laughs> it looks a bit like whoop. but uh it adds to character so i like it very much and i was ready to shave my head fully for that project were it not for the other projects where i would have started shooting before we started with um sambo but it was amazing to shoot with andre again we had another project which we just finished a couple of months ago uh it's kind of like a western we shot somewhere in the taiga really in the forest and really that's the kind of stuff i i'm interested in as well it's like rough how to say rough project rough stories where it's about survival it's not like it's not in an, in an office let's put it that way so yeah and what about the Red Ghost? How did you get cast in the film? Uh, Red Ghost was, um, that was some years ago when I heard my, through my agent that they were going to shoot like a movie called Red Ghost. And I was like, okay, whatever. And I heard it's a World War II story. I was like, okay. And they want to cast me for a Nazi. I was like, okay, let's have a look. And it was really a very stupid role, very small, a couple of shooting days, very stereotype. Nazi he was just he would go in he would kill everyone get killed and that was it very black and white so I still went for the casting because I felt okay whatever let's meet the guys what they want to do but I told them guys I mean this is a nice a very a nice story but this character is super boring um, so I will not play it this way but you guys are cool and they said okay what do you suggest and then I said well I mean if you want I mean there is much potential if we change the character but here there 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 and we met a couple of times and they were ready to do that. Andre was immediately like, of course, let's see, let's hear your opinion. And then we kind of developed the character together and the story grew and they had like another draft. And then we couldn't shoot that winter because there was no snow for whatever reason, not enough. They wanted to shoot in March and it was really like everything was melted. So they postponed the uh, general shooting for the year after the winter after. And we were so lucky because there was so much snow. Really, we had like to order special machines to clear paths to the shooting location because everything was just like probably like in Finland right now. <laughs> it was crazy, and they um, and by that time my character became quite big, and he became a human being before he was just a, how to say like a stereotype. It was just like a black and white, two dimensional figure. So what we added was that he was not a Nazi initially. He was just like a super soldier. He liked the tactics, he liked the, the, the challenge of who's the better soldier in war and uh, all the other German roles, to be honest, they're so nice, actually. They're, so, they're a bit stupid, but they're very nice and warm-hearted. And it's kind of the first time in Russian cinema where I saw um, German soldiers depictions as nice guys. So would there be no war? 
they would probably be friends with Russians in a second. But because they were on different sides, the moment the, the enemy approached, they all took their weapons and started shooting. And that was kind of like one of the, the big uh, points why it took the guys seven years to make the movie. Because they uh, didn't get funding. Because people thought it was not patriotic enough. And I feel this movie is one of the most patriotic movies you can ever imagine because it's about the unknown soldier and about all the sacrifices they had to endure when the Nazis like invaded. But many people didn't see it that way. And then Andre and I really think that you couldn't like um, praise that high enough because he, uh, many producers came on board or wanted to come on board and said, okay, I'll give you the money, but uh, you have to change this and this and this or that and that, blah, blah. And Andre said, no, no, no. I want to have my version. And because he saved his version to the very end, very, very end, the movie became a success, in my opinion. Unfortunately, they didn't have power enough to energy enough to send it to any festivals. They didn't say anywhere, the movie. I was shocked, unfortunately. But, and the premiere was set somewhere in, after COVID to another lockdown, somewhere in end of June, 35 degrees outside, no one watched the movie, of course. And they said, okay, it's another success, buy next movie. But then it got picked up by all the streaming services and it became like an instant success overnight, really. Like, it was for two or three weeks, it was number one on three different platforms, so that was nice. And afterwards, it was, uh, yeah, it was history, basically, because then it was like an over and over time and people watched it again, so I was very happy because I initially believed very much in that project and I kept telling Andre that you are the Russian Tarantino. You should keep doing it. He said, no, no, don't worry. And I said, no, do it. It's like the best advertisement you can do. And now they read it everywhere. And it came even up to a point when they were doing the uh, very strange poster for the movie. And I said, no, I want to have a real nice, cool Hollywood-like poster. And so I drew it myself. And then they used this to, to make the, the final version. So that, was, and that was one of the reasons why Andrew um, later approached me and said, come on. I want you to be a, a creative producer on the next film, Legenda Sam. But that's how I ended up. It wasn't even my idea. He came to me. And I'm very happy that he did because it was a really amazing experience for me and kind of like a new level, a new step in my filmmaking life. So, yeah. So that's very interesting. And is it, uh, was it initially very difficult to play in uh, films about World War II? Yeah, it was initially, it is always hard and difficult because it's not, a, it's not fiction. It's, you know, that these things really happened and, wor and worse. So, uh, I mean, this, in the case of Red Ghost, it was, first of all, it was like a kind of a Western or Eastern, as Andre said, but it is always, um, so there was, an, an, how to say, it was dark humor in it. It was a bit like Inglorious Bastards, you could say, the Russian or the Eastern answer. But two years before that, I did Sobibor, which is a real story based on, on, on real events about the mass breakout of a um, death camp of the Nazis in not Poland. It's called Sobibor, the place. And uh, there was Hapiensky, and it was just really like, I mean, I really sometimes was on set and it was, I was, I was such in a dark mood because I knew that what we're doing here and what happens here on set happened and even worse in real life and all these jewish people it was like a huge set was also sent to the oscars by russia actually and it was Havienski's um, debut as a, as a director and we really were shooting uh blog 16 17 hours night shoots somewhere in vilnius i think we we're shooting and it was uh rainy it was dark and they had fires everywhere and it looked real it looked and, and and everyone was so in character even the people who played the shoes especially them they were like dressed poorly and dark and it was it was really hard and then going out there with a gun thank god my character who was in real life a pure a, a monster there are a few monsters but he was one of them but we changed it somehow because um Kostya, the director, didn't see me the, in that way, thank God. So we changed into a young, naive Joker. He was a Nazi, but he didn't really, he was kind of naive, he was a bit stupid. And in the end, he was kind of the most positive of all the people. And he didn't kill, he never killed the whole movie. I was very happy he never tortured anyone. And uh, in the end, when the outbreak happened and everyone was killed, he wasn't even there. And initially, if you look back at the history, 
because he was there was the only reason they could break out because he was such a monster, the real character, Gustav Wagner, that they couldn't, he didn't have a schedule. They couldn't predict where he would be in order to like uh, over, overtake him and, and kill him, whatever, what they did with all the other guards. But he, being the second in command in the whole lager, death camp, he didn't have a schedule. He just popped up wherever he wanted to. So it was impossible to, 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 um, to, I have to say, in order to, it was impossible to predict. Yeah, to predict in order to, to know where he will be the next minute. So they couldn't plan with him because he was like a big X. No one knew what would happen. And that was, uh, very that was a tough project that was world war ii and it's, and it's targets there was another movie called zoya about zoya kosmodemianskaya she was like a russian martyr a young girl who was basically captured by the nazis because she was behind enemy lines meaning behind on the on the german side burning russian uh buildings in order for the nazis not to find anything where they can like uh, sleep at or like get some warmth during the hard, harsh russian winter but the problem was that the Russian population wasn't happy about that either. I mean, if someone comes, to, comes of, of your own, it doesn't matter who, who does, but you wouldn't be happy if anyone burns down your, your house. It doesn't matter if it's German or Russian. But she was on a secret mission, apparently, by Stalin, who said, okay, you have to be like sabotage and, and destroy as much as possible there. And uh, so, and there I also like refused in the beginning. I refused quite a lot about these roles. But they wanted me to, to, to play the main German negotiator, who was kind of a, like a psychologist. And when I met the director, Emil told him, yeah, thank you, it's an interesting project, but the character is too, too, too bad because he was initially, first drive was torturing, killing, but he was sadist. And I told him, that's a very interesting character, but I will not play it. I'm not the kind of guy, I don't want to do that. And then he, they changed it. They said, no, no, that's okay, then give the torture part to someone else. And, and we turn it into my character kind of falling in love with uh, Zoya, seeing like a like-minded spirit, soul, and deciding, okay, maybe we can, he's trying to save her, because what happened was they just need her information, who else was there, which she already had, they just need her to confirm. And uh, my character tried everything within his power to save her. In the end, she was too stubborn, according to the story, so it, he couldn't do it, but, uh, so he was not a Nazi Nazi either, so that was, the way I approach it, of course, and um, but those are dark stories. So that's really that's a bit like those movies you don't only do to entertain. You do them to educate and to show people how far human beings can go. So the main, in my opinion, the main reason to do such movies is to tell people never we should do that again. We should never repeat that. And the layer of civilization is very thin. And we saw it during COVID even, when people were starting, or is it like toilet paper? There were like fights in supermarkets about toilet paper. And you feel like, I mean, what is happening with you people? So even like the moment you switch off one of the leverages of comfort of people, they immediately like feel threatened and shut down in themselves a little bit. And the small, thin layer of civilization is easily wiped away. And that's, and then just imagine if you like are in a foreign country for or five years of harsh world war behind you. No, no food, nothing. Of course, you care only about yourself. And uh, so, and now with all the technology we have, all the internet, all this messengers, something no, most of the time also fake news, unfortunately, but we have the a way and means of informing ourselves. So I really recommend everyone, no, don't only believe the first opinion you hear, go out there, get as many opinions of different um, sides as possible. So especially if, if there's a big conflict between two sides. And if you pick one side, that's fine, of course, please. And if you feel like that's, a, that's, that's the reality and that's justice and that's just like fair, but I recommend everyone to at least have a look at the other side and try to understand what's happening there. I'm, and I'm not saying to justify that, I'm just saying just to understand both views of the same conflict and that will help you to de-escalate for both sides and for your own good. 
because if we and I feel like now we're in a state in the world where we're just escalating, escalating, escalating. We're fueling the fire again. Because some individuals, it's never nations, individuals are profiting a hell of a lot about that of that. And that's like something I detest, to be honest, when you really like in it, like literally when you earn money and make a profit and living off the death and torture of others. And that's basically the whole weapon industry. You could like unfortunately boil it down to that. So I never understood the concept I have to buy a gun, or wear a gun to protect myself against other guns. I never, that's just me, I never understood. And I've been doing martial arts for such a long time. I, I was shooting guns all the time in all the movies only, but in real life I'm a pacifist, I would never touch a gun. I think it's actually stupid. But that's also why I'm not in Austria and not anywhere else because it's a very safe country and we have actually very strict gun laws here. So in order to have a gun, you have to make like trainings every two or three years you have to have your gun locked at home with the key somewhere else so it's really like and the police comes unannounced and checks that so that's like but that's the way our world is drifting into right now and i would like just to remind or help remind people that uh, there is more connecting us than actually separating us and uh, what was it like uh, when you went, first went to Russia to shoot the mini snipers? Yeah, it was actually, it was super interesting because I never thought about Russia before. And when there was a, a casting offer for a quite big budgeted um, TV series called Snipers for Russian TV. And uh, it was a bit like Romeo and Juliet set in war. Two snipers getting the, who fell in love with each other before the war a Russian girl sniper and a German male sniper. And they uh, fell in love and then the war happened and suddenly they get the, the order to shoot one another. It's very dramatic, of course. And uh, I was initially cast at the audition for the big bad guy, the full Nazi, who's like ideologically Nazi, blah, blah, blah. And, but then a week before the casting happened in... Uh, Moscow that was 2012 I think 2013 they um, called me and said you know if you're interested uh, we'd like to cast you for the lead role as well for the good Nazi the Nazi Romeo and the only thing you have to do is uh, learn like a lot like six pages uh, scene in Russian and I was just like, of course, of course, no worries. I was in the middle of like rehearsals for theater. I had no time at all. I really hung up and I was like, what's happening? I have no clue. I have no clue. And then I didn't even understand the Russian, except for I couldn't even read it. So I called a colleague of mine who was Russian and he asked him, please, can you just like read it to me and slowly so I can write down what I hear. It was just like, it was like a magic spell what I wrote down. And then every three seconds at night, it was just like remembering, remembering like, repeating this whole thing in my head again and again and again, like a loop. And then in the end, I um, flew to Russia, flew to Moscow. It was like February, super cold, minus 35 or minus 30, no, minus 32 at night. During the day, it was only minus 26 in Moscow where everything was freezing. Touch screens wouldn't work, <laughs> I remember that. And then we we uh, were shooting in Moss Film Studios and it was a huge set. It was really, that was like, uh, two guys only for the um, uh, for the smoke in the background. They, they I remember they put like a, a makeup on my hands. I wore everything except including a four kilo sniper rifle. Only for the audition. I was just like, is this a bit too much? No, no, that is exactly as we want it. And then of course no one spoke English, so I had a translator there. And it was it was hilarious because my uh, my co-lead uh, Tatiana Arngold, she was quite a big star back then in Russia. She came uh, a bit late, I remember, and she didn't learn her lines. So she just told me like in Russian, full Russian, of course, uh, I, I think it's okay. I mean, I didn't learn her lines. I'll improvise a bit. Okay, it's fine. And I just looked to the um, to my <laughs> interpreter. So uh, what did you say? And he translated, I was like, ah, okay, thanks. Okay. Thank, please tell her, because she didn't speak English either, of course. Please tell her that she can do whatever she wants. I learned my lines and I don't care what she does, she'll, I'll, I'll speak my lines. <laughs> so he translated and she was like, oh, uh, give me five minutes. And then she learned the lines. 
and then we uh, actually had like uh, a v very weird, very intense casting. And then I think two or three weeks later, they called me and said, uh, we're going to play the lead. And I was just like, what happens now? I had to like get out of two theater productions in Munich where I was part of the ensemble. And then I started shooting there and it was three months. It was crazy intense. I didn't speak the language. I just learned the lines because I, I only had the time either learn the lines or learn the language. So of course I chose the lines because I really didn't need that. So what I what I need to speak was a bit like okay, um, Germany is better, and I knew words for gun, I knew words for for war and everything. But that wouldn't help me if I wanted to buy milk at night in the supermarket, of course. So, but it was a really really nice experience. I really felt very uh, how to say appreciated there, and they are super nice people. And I really felt the old atmosphere of Chekhov, of Stanislavski, and basically all the modern theory of acting is based in Russia. That's where it comes from. I mean, all the modern teachers and um, who developed their own techniques, uh, Sanford Meissner, Stella Adler, and all this stuff, they all studied with um, Stanislavski when he was in Paris for six months. So... And they founded their knowledge and their, their own theories and their techniques on his studies. And I felt that. I felt there was like an old, really big appreciation for the art of acting, for the art of theater, for the art of film. So we had an applause after some takes. And I never had that on a, on a movie set. I wasn't like, oh, what's, what's, what's happening? Are they they're talking about us? I was really like, but in the end, they were, it's, it was a really nice experience. And then I asked Tatiana whether she believes there might be, um, through a translator of course, whether she believes there might be a chance to work a bit more in Russia because it was such a nice wild, wild, wild East experience. And she said, yes, of course. And she introduced me to her agent, which is still my agent in, uh, in, 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 in Russia, Roman Vlasov. He's a good friend of mine. And, uh, and he said, he immediately started working. said, okay, let's give it a try. Why not? It's a huge market, but it would be good if you would learn a little bit of Russian. And so I tried, I did it, but I ended up doing two or three other projects with an uh, interpreter on set, usually a young, very good looking Russian girl who spoke amazingly Russian, English or German, but usually it was her first time on set. So she had no clue what was important for me to translate. So she ended up translating something, but not stuff that was important to me. I would have said that, like, what did you say? She was like, oh, this guy, this guy, what are we shooting? I, I, don't, I don't know, I have to, have to look it up. No, don't look it up, it's fine. And then in the end, I really felt like I was blind and deaf on set. And then I said, you know what? Please, next project without any translator. And that was when I started to learn the language. And it was actually a unique chance to learn a language because no one either wanted to or couldn't speak English at least not where I was shooting. And that was a unique chance. So I really like started to step by step, shaksa shagam, learn the language. And now I'm kind of fluent, so I'm, I'm very happy. It was like an amazing experience. And who knows what's gonna happen next, of course, with the, right now with the current political situation, unfortunately, but I had an amazing decade in the wild, wild east, as I call it. And I had many, I learned a lot. I'm very grateful for how much I could do there, how much I have done, how many people I've worked with, got to know and got to portray and uh, meet. So I'm very grateful. So, and you should have, that's also something you should never forget. Uh, for whoever is nice to you or be it like a country, be it a person or institution or like a circle of friends, I don't know. Never forget that, never take it for granted. So I think being grateful is one of the biggest superpowers we can have as human beings. So, one thing, um, you started your career in the telenovela Sturm der Liebe. Mm -hmm. I also watched uh, this series when I lived in Finland, we had it on television. Oh, really? <laughs> yes, but Sorry. I watched the series before you came to the okay. show. And uh, I learned German a bit when I was watching it, I was trying to study German. And um, what was it like to work uh, on the series? It was your first uh, success, yes? Mm -hmm. It was interesting because it was uh, exactly three days after I graduated from drama school. I started shooting there and that was uh, as a lead for um, such a big successful show. It was quite a lot of responsibility and load on my shoulders. 
because it's as you know telenovela is like a format which is a bit like a modern fairy tale so there's prince and princess they meet each other they love each other they cannot come to each other whatever it takes a year until they finally um, marry move out and then the next couple comes basically so it's like a, like a never-ending story the setting is in this case it's a five-star hotel somewhere in the south of um, Munich in the beautiful Bavarian landscape but uh, it was not how to say I, I studied drama first I did medicine I really went deep into um, all this theatrical off-theater underground movies short films in the dirt somewhere when I express something very very artsy and then I came to Storm of Love where it's beautiful it's nice so what there was one saying I really <laughs> I never forget is like impression before logic so if something looks nice let's do it so if I made the mistake of asking yeah but why should I do it a wrong question it looks nice it was interesting because it was one year it was uh, 220 shooting days and uh, we shot and you as a filmmaker should know that 45 minutes per day mm -hmm. so usually when you shoot like a feature film eight nine minutes max in Hollywood it's sometimes 30 seconds we shot 45 minutes per day it was such a huge such a professional crew they had two directors, they had seven operators, minimum two or three different sets every day built somewhere, always indoors and two or three outdoors. So you were traveling nonstop, especially as the lead couple. They really like tr shipped us nonstop. So it was five, six shooting days per week. It was tough. It was really tough. It was an amazing experience because there was no time for any, for any, um stardom issues oh, i'm a star can i do that no why why would i well there was no time there was simply no time for that and that's like the best workshop the best work experience you can ever get because it really trains you to be disciplined otherwise you just go down it's impossible because you're constantly behind time whenever you're shooting there and this pressure uh that taught me a lot and that basically everything almost everything after this was um, easier stress-wise so and the stress i had later on in bigger projects and big production international blah 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 was not due to too much to do but due to seven eight hundred people on set horses animals the sun is setting rain is coming we have to shoot now hurry up we change the sets blah blah so basically the stress that came afterwards was easier for me to deal with because of storm of love so i'm really grateful for the experience there so for me, Storm of Love was a, an immeasurably um, important experience, but I didn't want to repeat it. So I was really, afterwards came many requests for soaps, for another table of veils, whatever, but I really said, no, I don't want to see any camera anymore. After this year, I was really fed up until here. So I went to theater for two years. I played in a, in a very nice theater in Munich. It was part of the ensemble. For one year, I didn't shoot anything. I was really just on stage six, seven days per week doing different kinds of plays. We rehearsed, we finally rehearsed. We like see what we, we, we how to say, we dove into, we dived into characters, situations. I mean, really like artistic work. But then after one year, I slowly started to realize, actually, I want to do a little bit more filming because that was my first love. The reason I came to acting from a very academical and medical background uh, was movies it was not theater I love theater I still love it but movies are my first love as I always said filmmaking and the whole experience this this magic when you come to a uh, premiere or just watching with or without popcorn you just sit there and the lights go out and and everyone sees the same movie it's like I really I really love it and uh, theater is different kind of magic but it's a different profession so afterwards i really felt this i started to actually we i produced a couple of short films and um, then came the request from a strange country in the east and uh, fully out of my whatever 
aura of 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 um, experience and i felt like it's something totally new but on the other hand why not let's give it a try and uh, as an actor in person one of my favorite no one of my ways of uh, deciding things was uh, when it comes to very tough decision between A or B then I always try to picture myself as two clones of myself so Wolfgang A, Wolfgang B Wolfgang A chose his version A, Wolfgang B chose his version B and if they both go this way and then I would ask myself okay which version would I be more interested in watching and that's usually not always but I try to do it that's usually the version I'm choosing. So, and that's how I decided to try the Russian project. That's how I decided to go into acting from a very safe and and, and uh, set profession as a surgeon or a doctor. And then, um, yeah, also now, I mean, we just talked about that before, but the way I perceive my career from now on is also like stepping into the unknown. It's something you have to get used to. So basically, uh, Storm of Love really helped me a lot, prepared me for the business. And then, I mean, I heard many stories of people of act right afterwards. I wanted to shoot in serious stuff and Tato did some crime investigation series, some tough stuff, which I did in drama school. But no one cast me for that. They all saw me like the Prince Charming from Storm of Love, and I said, I can do something else. No, we don't believe you, or we don't see that in you. We want you as Prince Charming. For this and this, very light-hearted, you can do like da 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 whatever. I said, no, I don't want to do that. So we refused many of those roles until they stopped sending them. I said, okay, that's fine. And then I um, made my way back through Russia, interestingly. So also through Russia came UK and American projects. I played Russians in Hollywood was, and in England. It was super funny. Can yeah. you tell more about these films? So there was one I'm really proud of. It's called Action Team. It's a UK production uh, with uh, Tom Davis and uh, produced by him and some, and some of his friends. It's also a super nice story how they came up with that. And it's basically a very goofy, very dark UK comedy, spy comedy basically and my initially my character was supposed to his name was Bogohart <laughs> an Austrian Russian counter spy and I really had to talk of course it was in English but in the beginning I talk as a very Austrian Austrian actor a bit stupid and I say hello my name is uh, Bogohart and I want to help you whatever and then it turns out that he is actually a Russian counter spy <laughs> who can try to do whatever they want but I'm watching you. I'm watching you very deeply. Anyway, it was a really interesting um, experience because initially it was supposed to be in one episode. In the end, I'm in almost every episode because they like made the role bigger and bigger because we like it was really amazing working with the guys and they improvised a lot and yeah. In the end, there's like a whole heist story and a kidnapping story and action sequences and blah. It was really fun. So it's called Action Team. And that was kind of my initiation to the UK market. We're shooting in London and in uh, Sofia, Bulgaria. Yeah. And uh, it was, I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed that very, very much. And after this, I, I did a couple of smaller things in the UK and one project in America. And then came uh, Vikings Valhalla. That was, we shot right during COVID. That was super tough because. I actually got COVID while I was there in quarantine in the hotel. So I had to prolong the hotel stay and it drove me crazy. I was like, I think the hotel for, without leaving my room for almost 20 days. It was a nice hotel, a five star in Dublin, but I couldn't see it anymore in the end of the 20 days. I did everything already, workouts every day and whatever. Room service knew me already, <laughs> it was super funny. But uh, that was nice. That was also one of my dreams uh, to play in Vikings and with all my sword fighting and martial arts experience and my me being a fantasy nerd. That was just really like hit all the right tunes, all the right strings, and that was that was amazing. So I really liked being there with the people. Super nice cast, super nice team, very professional, and uh, yeah.
so that was and then uh, some other parts came along so right now i'm as you know i'm in the west now as i officially say and try to and um, building up my career here again what do you think is the main difference when you work in uh, hollywood in the uk projects and when compared to uh, germany austria and russia so basically you can of course generalize but i always say the fully depends on the crew and on the director, on the filmmaker, how they want to tell their story and how they are as a person, how they treat people. And you can have very strict directors who are control freaks in Germany, which happens quite often, and uh, in Russia or in America, and you can have like super casual, uh, less affair directors in Germany, in Russia, American, anywhere. Basically, it depends on them. But if you want to talk cliche, and there is something to it, otherwise there would be no cliche, is that uh, Russia is very chaotic. Meaning that they don't like to plan ahead. They, 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 they don't like to plan at all, actually. I get the impression sometimes. And they're always like, they're always mad, personally mad, at the weather, if something unforeseen happens, someone gets sick. They're like, oh my gosh, how could this happen? Bob shit, this is impossible. Oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Why, why, why? But actually, in the end, they're only angry with themselves because they didn't plan. <laughs> if that happens in Germany or Austria, like, okay, whatever, we kind of, or in America, oh my gosh. Yeah, we have, we have a system, system, like we have like a safety system, A, B, C, D. If this happens, then this, 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 everything is planned ahead, which is nice. The good side of this chaos in Russia is that they're always open to some spontaneous magic happening while if you are too restrictive in what you have planned and everything's planned through blah 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 you kind of squeeze that creative moment out of it that's the, the problem sometimes not always of course but i was shooting on a one of the biggest sets i've ever been to i played a small part was mission impossible and this was like seven, eight hundred, nine hundred people on set. It was crazy. And uh, but there was so much money involved that there was almost no space for any improvisation because everything was already planned ahead, months and years for that specific shot. So they had to do it the way they planned it. That's a bit tougher. And on the other hand, when you come to a to a smaller set, they have much more freedom, of course, to experience that. I'm not, and I'm, I'm not saying one is better than the other, I'm just saying there's like differences. And then on the other hand, I heard that there's like also crazy directors like Taika Waititi who um, takes that money, takes that huge budget and said, okay, let's improvise, let's see what happens. But that takes a lot of guts and a lot of experience, and a lot of good taste to, to do that, to pull that off. So, in my opinion, and, uh, and, and Russia is very creative, but not so well prepared. While uh, Austria and Germany, if you want to put them together, uh, they are very well prepared. Up to a point where there is uh, no more project, but only preparation. And uh, like, I like this project in Austria, I just did like three months ago, two months ago. Uh, it was a really nice experience. They were very well prepared. There was much space, but it was a very nice Kati, like the director. She really gave us enough space to develop the character to see what's happening, where we could go with it, blah, blah. blah. So it's, it all depends on the, in the end, like I said in the beginning, it, it depends on the director and the person, the personality and experience of the director because filming is one of the last true dictatorships left in our society, which are still kind of like accepted because and solemnly because of that it be depends on the director how the movie is shot in the end so it's his or hers responsibility that the movie becomes a success or a flop and that's why and it's his or her vision everyone is working towards to of course it's a it's a project together but if the movie flops no one will say the light was bad no one will blame the light guy they might blame the actors because they lend their faces to it, but even actors, if they do a good job, they will say like, yeah, but the edit is wrong, blah, blah, blah. But everyone will pl blame the director. So it comes with a lot of risk, but also with a lot of um, opportunities in the end. So filming is, yeah, 
that's what I love about it. It's, it's always a risk. It's like kids that never really grew up, but play with bigger money to tell bad, bedtime stories. Because in the end, it's nothing else we do, we entertain. We show social dilemmas, of course, but as Shakespeare did, if we do that in a non-entertaining way, no one will watch it. So in my opinion, the big magic of theater as well, but mainly of film, is to tell something important in an entertaining way. If you could have dinner with any person, dead or alive, who would it be? My, I mean, I think that might change, but right now it probably would be Robin Williams, the actor who killed himself. He was, yeah, I think I would choose him actually to have dinner with him. I think he could share something about life, about the profession, about work. No one else could. Did you know that he had it in his writer, in his contract, whenever he shot a movie, that they had to employ at least 20 homeless people? Yes, I read it. It's yeah. amazing. It's amazing, yeah. And if you look at, like, what was it like, the Dad Poet Society or Goodwill Hunting or Mrs. Doubtfire, pff, this movie, this, this, I, mean, was, if, I mean, he was such a talent, such a warm person at the same time, and that rarely happens. So, yeah, that would be my pick. And nowadays, if I could probably, I would, I don't know, invite Waikata, Waikata, uh, I would, Waikata, what was his name? Taika Waititi. Taika Waititi, thank you. <laughs> I was I was mixing it up. So today probably I would I would take um, Taika Waititi because I'm really interested in his work. I loved Hunt for the Wilder People, and of course everything modern like from Star Wars to to Our Flag Means Death, and he's uh, and also like Thor: Love and Thunder. The way he takes this that's what I meant. He's one of those guys who who really takes uh, the big budgets and turns them into a very funny success. So. It would be him, yeah. What is the best movie you have ever seen? The best movie I've ever seen. I would have to go into category, but um, one of the movies that left the biggest impression on me, let's put it that way, which I rewatched several times, was Lord of the Rings. That's a trilogy, but whatever. Then there is. Then there is The Green Mile, so it's a really good movie, which just pops up in my head. Then, um, I mean, there's Shawshank Redemptions, these classics. So basically, movie that really explore the darkness within humans, but always with a twist to the light. So it's kind of like it leaves you with a positive feeling. So that's also my aim as a filmmaker, that a movie that only waves the finger, shakes the finger and says, you don't you do that, that's bad, people are bad, blah, 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 blah. Um, that leaves you with a question that's also possible, of course. But I personally prefer when it leaves you with a, with a feeling like, okay, there is good in the world. When there is a message of moral where you feel like, okay, that's a story that leaves me with a good feeling that I have to do something maybe, something has to change, or we have to work more together, like I said, or focus on what connects us rather than what separates us. But it still leaves me with this warm, fuzzy feeling, and that's kind of like one of the superpowers of cinema, in my opinion. Because in theater, it's a bit strange, because if you have this feeling, it's a bit, it was not a good theater evening. It feels a bit like it was cheap or it was bad quality, whatever. There's a thing in theater when you have to read at least 10 books of secondary literature in order to understand what's happening on stage. And then I feel like it's a bit like they're, I don't know, they're fully showing off how smart and intelligent and sophisticated they are and how stupid the audience is. And that pushes me away as an audience member. But that's just me and my two sets. But uh, in the end, uh, yeah. What kind of hobbies do you like to do in your spare time? 
So I love doing sports, of course, all kinds of right now. I'm in the gym, I do CrossFit, I do skiing. It's a nice season right now, it's a nice winter here. And uh, to relax, I do, I paint miniatures. Yeah, it's, it's a big hobby of mine. It's called Warhammer, it's from, from the UK initially. I started, off, I started doing it when I was a teenager, 12, 13-ish, I don't know. Then I lost it over the years and I rediscovered it during Storm of Love. Strong believer because it gave me this small world of miniatures where I had full control, where I could really focus, and it was like calming down and meditation. And I went to a, I mean, I was a bit, <laughs> I was a bit crazy because I attended world championships of painting and I won some awards even for painting and stuff. I really loved it and I still love it. And I kind of rediscovered it together with my brother. And it is not only a hobby where you paint, but you can also play games or you create your own landscape and you, and, you, and you play. And it's a huge growing community online. It's huge. It's bigger than Star Wars. The IP is huge. And they just like signed off a big deal with Henry Cavill about doing a big Amazon series about that. And that's just the start. They have like a five or ten year deal. It's going to be more and more. And it's, and it's huge. And it's a huge fan base worldwide. So I'm one of many. But uh, I see many parallels between this, and many people think it's just stupid nerddom, but it isn't actually. Between this and um, movie making, actually, telling stories, because that's what I like when I paint some miniatures. I want to tell a story with this, and it's just a different medium. But in the end, it's, there's many similarities. So for me, it's, it's just a different way to express myself as an artist, and using uh, brushes, using uh, paints, using this sculpting paste to create something three-dimensional is for me similar to creating a character which I'm playing because I'm also three-dimensional most of the times and I have clothes, I'm set in a story and, and I have a life and so do my miniatures so I'm, and it's usually fantasy or science fiction so it's something out of the ordinary and that's the stories I'm interested in as well. So something that you dream about, you, you fantasize about, and it takes you away, it invites you to a journey you would probably never have in your life, or maybe just dream about. So yeah, those, those are my hobbies so far. Okay, thank you, Boyfriend. Thank, thank you, you very much. Question.